Hey yo, Antonio. In an eye clinic, you can be presented with many interesting cases, but one topic in particular that is often overlooked and misunderstood is the herpes virus. How common is it and how bad can it get? The WHO estimates that globally, two in three people under the age of 50 are already infected with herpes. But why is it that no one really talks about it? And what happens to our eyes when we become infected? So in this video, we'll explore the ins and outs of herpes and the impact it has on our eyes. And later, I will show you a real case where I had to treat such a condition. To understand herpes in the eye, we must first divide the virus into two different types, herpes zoster and herpes simplex. Although they share the same name of herpes, they do behave slightly differently. Let's begin with herpes zoster, commonly known as shingles. Herpes zoster is caused by the reactivation of the varicella zoster virus, a virus that 99.5% of the American population born before the 1980s is already infected with, also known as chickenpox. If you've had chickenpox as a child, then you most likely still have this virus living in your body as we speak. Even after a person recovers from an initial chickenpox episode, the virus doesn't go away, but it remains dormant in our nervous system, and later in life it can reactivate, resulting in herpes zoster. The exact cause of herpes zoster reactivation is not fully understood, but factors such as age, weakened immune system, stress, and certain medical conditions can increase the risk. The reactivated virus travels along the nerve pathways, causing inflammation and pain in specific areas in the body. The most common symptom of herpes zoster is a painful rash that usually appears as a band or cluster of blisters on one side of the body. The rash follows the path of a specific nerve and can be accompanied by itching, tingling, or a burning sensation. Other symptoms may include fever, headaches, fatigue, and sensitivity to light. While most cases of herpes zoster resolve without complications, there are potential risks. One of the most significant complications is post-herpatic neuralgia, which is a persistent pain in the area affected by the shingles rash. Other complications may include bacterial skin infections and the loss of vision. If you suspect you have herpes zoster, it's crucial to seek medical attention promptly. Early treatment can help alleviate symptoms, reduce the severity of the infection, and lower the risk of complications. Antiviral medications are often prescribed to help speed up the healing process and alleviate the pain. One of the best ways to prevent herpes zoster is through vaccination. The shingles vaccine, typically a two-dose series, is recommended for individuals aged 50 and older. Vaccination can reduce the risk of developing shingles, and if shingles does occur, it can help lessen the severity and the duration of the illness. Herpes simplex is a viral infection caused by the herpes simplex virus, which is different to the varicella virus we talked about just before. Herpes simplex is further divided into two categories, HSV1, colloquially termed above the waist herpes that affects about 67% of the global population, and HSV2, termed below the waist herpes, affecting 13% of the population. HSV1 is typically associated with oral herpes, resulting in cold sores or fever blisters around the mouth or lips. HSV2 is primarily linked to genital herpes, affecting the genital region. However, it is important to note that both types can infect either the oral or genital area. Herpes simplex is primarily transmitted through direct contact with an infected person during active outbreaks. This can occur during intimate activities such as kissing, oral genital contact, or sexual intercourse. It's crucial to remember that herpes simplex can also be transmitted even if there are no visible sores or symptoms present. Additionally, sharing personal items like razors or towels with an infective individual can lead to its transmission. The signs and symptoms of herpes simplex can vary from person to person. 
During the initial infection, individuals may experience flu-like symptoms, including fever, body aches, and swollen lymph nodes. Following this, painful blisters or sores may develop in infected areas. In oral herpes, these blisters typically appear around the mouth or lips, while in genital herpes, they are found around the genital region. These blisters can break open, causing painful ulcers that eventually scab over and heal. One of the most distinguishing features of herpes simplex is its potential for recurrences. After the initial infection, the virus remains dormant in our body and can reactivate periodically, leading to recurrent outbreaks. Various factors can trigger these recurrences, including stress, illness, hormonal changes, exposure to sunlight, and a weakened immune system. While there is no cure for herpes simplex, there are treatment options available to manage the condition. Antiviral medications such as acyclovir, vacyclovir, or famcyclovir are commonly prescribed to help control outbreaks, reduce symptoms, and lower the risk of transmission. These medications can shorten the duration of outbreaks and alleviate discomfort. Additionally, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, managing stress levels, and practicing safe sex can all contribute to managing herpes effectively. One of the key differences between herpes zoster and herpes simplex is the site of infection. Herpes zoster typically affects a specific area of the body along the path of a single nerve, often appearing as a band or cluster of painful blisters. On the other hand, herpes simplex can manifest in various areas, such as the lips, the mouth, face, or genital region. Another important distinction is the mode of transmission. Herpes zoster is not transmitted through direct contact, but rather spread by inhalation of the varicella virus, which then reactivates within an individual about a third of the time. Herpes simplex, however, is highly contagious and can be transmitted through direct contact with active sores or through oral genital contact. Recurrence patterns also differ between herpes zoster and herpes simplex. Herpes zoster typically occurs as a one-time episode, although it can rarely recur in some individuals. In contrast, herpes simplex is known for its potential to recur throughout a person's lifetime. From an optometrist's perspective, zoster and simplex can be differentiated by a slit lamp examination. A close look at the eye under a microscope can show the different patterns each type likes to produce. Treatment approaches for herpes zoster and simplex vary. Antiviral medications are commonly prescribed for both conditions. For herpes zoster, oral medications help reduce the pain and speed up the healing process. For herpes simplex, antiviral creams or ointments can help control the outbreaks and alleviate the symptoms. It's important to note that herpes outbreaks can be managed. Herpes zoster can be more common than we think. I've had multiple cases of patients coming into the clinic unsuspectingly and later finding out they have herpes in the eye. Although I can't show you the actual photo of one of my patients during an episode, I did attempt to illustrate what she looked like at the time. The left eye was very red and underneath she had facial rashes from the damage that the virus had done to the skin. The vision in the left eye was significantly reduced and a close-up of the eye showed pseudodendritic ulcers making her vision blurry. I had her start on oral antivirals and within a few weeks she was back to normal with no permanent damage. If this was left untreated, this could have ended up much worse which just highlights the importance of getting things checked out. In summary, herpes is a virus that can do different things to the body, but it's important to know what type of herpes it is because the treatment and outcomes can be very different. Herpes can impact our eyesight when it attacks, and I would recommend getting it checked out if you suspect any abnormalities. But that's all I have for you today. If you've learned something new, or at least found something useful, then yay, thumbs up to you. If you want to thumbs up back, then they'll be greatly appreciated. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video.